What's up, squad? From Reach Suite, I am Colin Smith, and welcome to Cold Ones Podcast. It's a show with chilly questions and even colder ice cream. And today, we're joined by my dear friend, Allison Metcalf. You know Allison as the Chief Revenue Officer at Claudinary, former CRO of Demandbase, and your favorite LinkedIn star with the coolest glasses in town. Welcome to the show, Allison. Thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. I love the backdrop. I love the backdrop. Thank you. Like you know the, what it is? This used to be an external deck. And then in the 80s, someone like put this weird bubble. You can kind of see over oh, it. Um, that is so cool. Yeah. I'm kind of like, I'm like indoor, outdoor living here to the extreme. That is really cool. I feel like that that makes the long office days a tad bit better. I get I get to see a lot. A lot goes on out here in my, in my, I see deer crossing the road and squirrels jumping around. And so, yeah, it's. It's a nice little backdrop and I'm looking outside, right? So when I'm looking outside my computer, I'm looking like outside. So it's, yeah. it's great. Yeah, it's yeah. great. I like that. I used to have a, a really cool view over the city, like looking in DC and I, you know, I, I'd vlog my 12 hour day, but I'd at least feel some, some happiness to see everyone walking back and forth to work. I was like, oh, there's a world out there. There's People are out. living, even if I'm not. Yes. Yeah, exactly. I at least know that at 9 PM when I emerged, what happened out there today? Well, thank you for joining Cold Ones. We are grateful to have you. Um, we've got Ice Cream One. When we jump into some personal rapid fire, do you have it with you? I do. Okay, beautiful. I Throw it off. I've got my ice cream cone here. And well, as always, Allison, I say we strategically select the ice cream for you. We don't just send you some random stuff. I understand that you went to school up in Minnesota. I've met in Minnesota, but I'd imagine that Minnesota has some awesome moose tracks. Maybe some some moose. I don't know what moose plural is, but there's probably some moose in Minnesota. Maybe. I have no idea. Um, probably, but I don't know. Like it's more, we, we talk a lot about wolves in Minnesota. Um, that's like the, the big scary animal, but, but I get it. It's close enough and I'm on board. Okay. I just Googled it. I actually didn't look this up. I just came across moose track. Okay. Spoiler. It's moose tracks, ice cream. Um, I came across <laughs> moose track. I was like, Minnesota seems like a place that has a lot of moose. And it says here on Google, Minnesota is one of the few States in the United States that have moose, the largest number of the deer family, about a thousand 1200 pounds. There we go. Well, who knows? Get some moose tracks. I'm going to jump in here. And Allison, the first part of cold ones is always the quick rapid fire personal. Everyone knows who you are based on your success at demand base and cloudinary and your LinkedIn, you know, fame, but who is Allison? Like who's the person behind the LinkedIn photo? And that's something that I, I really get excited to learn more about. So are you ready? I'm ready. All right. Question one. What's something that people often misinterpret about you? Anything. Um, well, if you're familiar with the Enneagram methodology, um, which I've been extensively coached in, in my executive coaching experience, there's a, there's an Enneagram personality type called the eight, which is a challenger that a lot of people in leadership positions end up being eights. Like they're big personalities. They're, they're kind of strong drivers or whatever. And people often think that I'm an eight, but I'm actually a two, which is called the helper. And it's a, it's a, it's actually a far softer personality type. In fact, at one of the companies I was at, the leadership team went through Enneagram and it was like, everyone was like jockeying to make sure that they were an eight because it was like the leaders were the eights, you know? Um, but I'm not, I'm a two. And I, that means I'm really motivated by with, with helping people. Uh, and on the negative side, my biggest kind of personal challenge is I struggle to ask for help or even realize where I need help. It's just, I'm not in tune to my own needs for help. Um, but yeah, Enneagram two in eight clothing perhaps is how okay. I would describe my personality. And for those who said she was an eight, you're wrong. She's a two. You're wrong. You're wrong. <laughs> That's interesting. That's actually a really good response. I'm not an eight, I'm a two. Um, mm -hmm. And what's something that few people know about you, Allison, that you wish more people did know? Um, that's okay. That's interesting. What I wish more people did know. I mean, I think from a positioning point of view, I, I think it's actually kind of interesting. My personal story is I never really said I was never ambitious um, growing up. I was never ambitious in college. I was going to be a journalist and travel. My My big dream was to be like a foreign correspondence and and things like that and I was this this was never kind of my my path and this was something I really did kind of stumble upon and my success has been really built up upon my my ability to execute and my performance and my desire to help people and coach people um it was I'm, I'm not like this really rapidly ambitious person and I don't think that people I don't know that I present that way or that people would assume would assume that but I really am uh not this like career crazy driven person um at all and this was never the plan, but I'm even thrilled that this has worked out. But, um, but yeah, I think people probably don't realize that. Yeah, that's cool. I saw that you studied journalism and was it sociology? 
Coach. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, which is not the typical right path of a CRO, but um, oftentimes I think if you if you subscribe to the generalist versus specialist mentality, it's actually yeah. better to have, you know, in the case of a CRO, it's better to have something outside of finance and economics. I think the generalist will rule the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you read the book? I've seen the headline. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I agree. I don't need yeah. to read the book. <laughs> hey, me too. Uh, there's a great book. Um, um, there's a great book called, I think, Generalists, Why well, They Rule the World, something of that nature. But I, I subscribe to it. I think it's really um, backed by a lot of evidence and interesting. <clears throat> okay. Most interesting celebrity encounter. Oh, my God. This story. This is like this is going to sound like a backhanded brag or whatever, but I had an opportunity once uh, to fly private and or not to fly, to, yeah, to, to fly private. And we landed in Teterboro, New Jersey, which is where, you know, once you've heard that word and you've been there and then you hear it all the time. And my coworker, I'm gonna say his name, Joel Jewett. Joel Jewett is like one of those legendary beauty guys in Silicon Valley, co-founder of Palm, good technology. He's like this amazing guy. He's like, he describes himself as painfully nondescript. He's super nerdy, whatever. So we get off, but he was on the plane with me. We get off this plane and we're like seeing this really tall person in a cowboy hat. And we're like, that's that's gotta be like a, you know, famous country music star or something. And we get closer and closer and Joel Jewett, again, this like nerdy beauty guy, he goes, oh my God, it's Carly Kloss. And I was like, what? He's like, from Project Runway, Project Runway. Cause he, he's like, I watched Project Runway with my daughter. It's Carly Kloss. And she was dressed up in this cowboy outfit. Cause she had, I knew from celebrity gossip that she'd been coming from her wedding in Wyoming. And so he makes me try to take a picture of her. And the picture is just as she's capturing the fact that I'm taking a picture of her and she's super annoyed. Uh, and that is my profile picture uh, for Joel in my phone. So whenever he calls me, Carly Kloss in, in a cowboy hat pops up just livid. They got um, <laughs> That's good. It's so funny. He was so excited. It was so unexpected. <laughs> this guy, yeah. It was out of character. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Um, okay. Last one. Wrapping it up. Most recent purchase over $250. This one's going to get me in trouble. Oh, um, no. Some segments of people, but I recently did bring a new golden retriever puppy into our household that cost more than $250. Mm. Uh, and uh, her name is Annie, Queen Anne. Um, she's oh. like eight, eight weeks and two days old. And um, I choose for my daughter. Yeah. My daughter's taking care of her. Um, and she's very sweet. But I did, I did, uh, I did. Hey. Beauty's beauty's not cheap. Uh, I'd imagine that a beautiful golden retriever is more than $250, probably upwards of $2,500, maybe even more. Um, anyways, congratulations to Queen Anne, finding a lovely house. Congratulations to your daughter. Um, all right, fast forward. We're moving on. Thank you for telling us a little bit more about who is Allison. Of course. I want to, I want to jump into the second part, um, which is the second ice cream. And this is more of the professional, more about how did you get to where you are and what are some unique, interesting piece of wisdom that you can share with their audience of, of revenue leaders? Do you have the second ice cream ready? I do actually. It's I'm like I've got it teed up right here. Okay, cool. let's let's show the camera. Let's get the camera in there. Is, hopefully, there's some chunks. Is there some chunks? You oh. can see the peaches in there. I'm sorry. All right. Oh, yeah. And no, no, no worries. So, <laughs> few people, maybe some people, may not know this, but your background, at least a portion of it, is in customer success. And I don't know why. But every time I dealt with customer success leaders, they just seem so peachy. They just seem <laughs> so kind and warm. They're like they're trying to help you be successful and they're patient versus sometimes the AEs that can be so brisk and, and uh, okay, yeah, yeah, go to a gloss or I don't know. So when I came across peachy and, uh, peaches and cream, I was like, that's for my CS girl, Allison, who's now the CRO. Um, so I hope you enjoy it. I'm loving it. All right. So that's actually the perfect segue into our first question here. And it's about your background in customer success, which is so incredibly interesting. I think even in, especially in today's economy and the, and just the shift to like taking better care of your, your customer base. Um, how does this color your role as a chief revenue officer? Well, yeah, I mean, I think I think my background in customer success is a feature, not a bug, if you will. You know, it's, it's a superpower because um, I think if you're a CRO that only has experience in net new logo sales, you really don't have the full appreciation for the entire customer life cycle and the, and the entire customer journey. I think hopefully in organizations that I'm running where I have the full picture, you know, you're not having this as, as much. There's going to be always be some healthy tension between pre and post sale. Uh, but I've been on the other side. I've been on both sides now. So I have empathy for, for what happens after that, you know, euphoric deal close happens. And it really makes me very, very focused on renewal rates and upsell targets and understanding you know, what a customer for life looks like and, 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 and the whole entire customer journey. I've spent a lot of time in my career 
trying to apply the science of sales process to the customer journey as well. I think I think that is where the magic happens is when you can be scientific about both pre and post. Um, and so I think it gives me a really unique um, purview or, or perspective that if someone's only been doing just net new logo sales, and even, even if you've had customer growth but haven't thought about renewals, that hurts a little bit as well because renewals don't just happen, right? That's the thing. Like a lot of spreadsheets and SaaS just plug in an assumptive 95% renewal rate that very rarely happens. And if it is happening, it's not without a lot of effort. And I appreciate that. And I respect that. And I respect the craft. And so I, I do think it's very helpful. Well, let me, let me ask you a, a question here that comes to mind. You know, new net new logo and customer health can at times be at odds in my brain. Why? Because the net new, think of the machine, right? Just signing everyone up. You want it, you want it, you want it, just sign it up with no regard for are they going to enjoy the product? They're going to be successful. And then it's really, and I tell our head of customer success this, his name is Adam. Uh, I love you so much because you make our dreams a reality, right? You make their customer dreams. They show up sometimes with bad sales and you're, you're having to deal with that. How are you balancing the, with, with your CS kind of respect for the craft, the net new uh, logo pressure to achieve that number, but also respect the health and, and the ICP? Yeah, I mean, so there's a couple of things. So one, it, it it goes even above me. Like our CEO, our CFO, like the whole company is very focused on NRR and 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 healthy growth. And so it's luckily here at Cloudinary, it's a cultural tenant. I think um, sometimes in some companies, not everywhere, but some companies where they only start to worry about renewal rates and whatnot when they start to dip below the model and they don't put, and then it's like this reactive, you know, oh, what do we have to change? Where I think this is kind of a cultural thing that we're thinking about all the time. So that's that's one thing. It's it's kind of in, 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 implanted, if you will embedded in the culture of, of the company. Um, I also think, you know, really creating this concept of one team. So one of the things I'm doing at Cloudinary in particular was prior to my arrival, the teams were working quite separately without a lot of awareness for what was, was happening with each other and how they were even impacting each other. So I'm putting a lot of effort towards creating this kind of one team mentality, including marketing, including rev ops, including SDRs, everyone, that we only win together and making sure everyone understands the, no, the, the key numbers that we have to hit outside of that new logo. We have a pipeline number to hit, by the way. We have a renewal rate number to hit. We have an upsell number to hit. Um, so that's that's a, that's a key part of it. Now, in other companies, I have seen uh, people try to solve this problem with compensation structures, you know, putting sticks in salespeople's comp plans if their deals don't renew or putting carrots in people's comp plans if they, if they do. I try to avoid that by just creating a culture that respects the customer, understands, you know, a leaky bucket in a SaaS company is just death, right? It's just... There's no, like, it's so hard to get new net new logos only for them to be marching out the door. And so I guess the final kind of piece that really helps shape this is the acumen around the model, right? And really making sure everyone understands, like I said, the whole picture of what success looks like from a revenue perspective and not just their sliver. So that that would hopefully make them more incentive to not, you know, not to, to be more cautious in the deals they close and, and ensure that they are setting up the post sale organization for success. Yeah, I, I, I was going to say that the, the way I've seen it solved is with the the carrots and sticks, right? Um, especially if you have an organization that's very point operated and sales folks are point operated. The one team in telling the culture, I think, is you're lucky you found a place that that values that, right? Because it's just yeah. not as common as, and I'm sure you, you know that more than I do. Yeah, it's not healthy to hit. Well, it's, I don't know. It's like I would, I would, if you're at a company that's like celebrating that new logo wins and has a 70% renewal rate or whatever, like you're probably, it's probably not the right place, right? Because that's not a really hard place. It's, it's really hard to get your renewal rate from like the 70s to the 85s where it belongs. And it's it's just objectively like false, like it's a false false confidence or something if you're hitting that new level targets, but not the renewal targets. It's not really a SaaS company, I would argue. So right, 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 right. It's, important to, it's important to figure that out quickly. Are there things that you've used? I know we're really drilling in this topic because I find it so interesting. Are there, are there, are there is, it, is it all around ICP? Is it around pain point? Like how have you been, how have you trained organizations to say, this is a good customer, this is a bad customer and you need to fire them for a pipeline? So I think it's, you hit it, like ICP is, ICP is really important and pain point identification is really important. Um, you know, so, well, so ICP, but ICP is a big part of ICP. It would be like in certain companies and certain products, like do they have the infrastructure to support this, this, the solution? I'll give you an example. Like I was around when customer success software really started to take off back when I was really focused on customer success. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there was like these, I'll, I won't name them all, but like all these customer success software things were popping up and I think that they believed like, oh, our ICP is any SaaS company. Any SaaS company needs customer success software. But what they didn't realize, and I realized the hard way, um, and I think a lot of companies do too, is you needed a customer success ops person. That's a qualifying question to be able to say like, do you have an ops person who can actually manage and run this tool the same way that you have sales ops for CRM? 
um, that would be a, an example of qualifying discovery or whatever to like to like determine if this is because if they would say no we don't have anyone that client's not going to be successful it's highly likely to to churn um or you could solve that with okay now in service what's your plan but but yeah like really getting tight on kind of objective external data revenue size industry whatever but then there's and then maybe there's some technographic data like when i was at live ramp for example we knew in the early days of live ramp we knew that if a client had a dmp uh, like a blue guy or an Adobe um, audience manager, they were far more likely to be successful with us because they just kind of got the vibe of what we were trying to do. Um, but there's a lot of cases where you have to probe. And yeah. so that qualifying criteria is just, it's just really important. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I think we fail, oftentimes fail to think about who is going to own and use this because it's a lot of hot potato. Yeah. You know, you can get someone really excited, um, uh, but they're not going to be the one that's managing it two, three hours a week sometimes, right? Well, yeah, and if yeah. you're like selling to the economic buyer as you should, um, you do need to kind of get, and you got to get a little practical sometimes, like how, what's the execution plan? And I think it's on you as a, as a supplier, vendor, partner, whatever you want to call yourself to make sure they understand what it takes to implement, what it takes to operate your tech tool or technology to make it successful. Um, cause if they don't have it, it's going to be wasted effort on, on everybody's part. So you may as well ask the questions. Yeah. Yeah. That's really, that's really helpful feedback. And I think it's a pitfall that a lot, a lot of mature organizations fall into as well. All right. So this is a really interesting one. And this is what I call like a fog of, uh, kind of like a, uh, a fog of war question or a, a um, uh, you've been in the trenches, right? A lot of times, and this all comes back, I had the opportunity to interview a band of brothers person. And I was like, how does the movie do in comparison to real world? And he's like, yeah, it's pretty good. But like something that movie's never gonna be able to share is like the smell, right? Like you can never get that. And so I think of that, that's what I call like a fog of war question. You clearly been a tenured CRO because one of the first things that you and I talked about was when bringing on a CRO, there's probably a large organizational transformation that's happening in the background. And what a lot of CROs or first-time CROs don't realize is how important their role is in that transformation. Um, I think first question is someone who's done this three or four times, what's the CRO's role and what's a likely transformation that's occurring when an organization's hiring a CRO? Talk through that a little bit. Yeah, so it's, it's great. I was actually on this advisory board meeting for another uh, company this morning. We were talking about this. Like I, I had a lot of energy and passion around the difference between a CRO and an SVP of sales. Yep. Um, and oftentimes when I'm talking to CEOs or boards or private equity folks, who tell me they need a CRO, you know, when I talk to them, I'm like, eh, it's, it's an SVP of sales. So a CRO, like here's, here's one way I think about this is I, I have an, I have an operating system framework. I don't have a playbook. And I'm intentionally saying that because a playbook implies I come in and I do the same thing and I run the same plays everywhere. And that's a disaster because no company is the same, but I do have an approach and a thought process and a framework that I, that I bring with me wherever I go, that lends itself into an operating system that is, you know, kind of like the internal guts, the operating system of the machine that I'm building, that I'm implementing. And I'm thinking about it from cold, net new, you know, named accounts within the ICP all the way through the customer, you know, all the way through SDRs, through sales, through demand gen, through customer success, through upsell, cross sell renewal, et cetera. Um, and, and that is really important because SVP of sales who have a really important job, obviously, like they're really work, working on current quarter, you know, closing the deal, making sure they're hitting the numbers. They, they don't have time or capacity typically to get their head up and start thinking about, the next quarter or, the, or three quarters from now. Like I'm thinking right now a lot more about Q1 FY25 than I'm thinking about Q1 FY24, frankly. And I think that's that's a key um, that's a key differentiator. But in terms of like why you're brought on board, there's a couple, like it's typically, it's typically something massive needs to change, right? So, so um, and I think what I have kind of figured out is my sweet spot is finding organizations that have been kind of 70% art, 30% science and inverting that ratio and getting way more science driven. And that's a key thing that I'm doing at, at Cloudinary, right? We didn't have a lot of sales excellence, um, sales excellence metric transparency or uh, what's the, like we weren't, we weren't even reviewing those types of metrics in, in with the cadence and the, and the discipline that I, that I think we should. We weren't thinking about pipeline holistically. We were thinking about it in terms of different channels. Um, we had different regions following the sales process in different ways, which kind of made the data very unusable, right? Or, or like unreliable. And so, and so they get, that's kind of my, that's my calling card is the 70, 30 kind of ratio split. Um, but transformation can also be, I've seen this too, where like, we're, we need to go from selling a point solution to a platform. We need to move from like, one of my, one of my best friends is the chief product officer at a large data security company. She wasn't CRO, but this company needed to go through a massive transformation from on-prem to cloud solutions. Like these are huge changes that a company has to go through that, you typically want someone to come in that's seen that movie before. Right, right. And seeing that movie before is very different than knowing the plot of the movie, right? A lot of people will say, oh, yes, right. what you're going to do is this. Yeah, but how many times have you done that? I understand that you can tell me like how to do it, but have you done it? Um, well, I also think it's like, I want to go back to that, what I said, because I'll, I'll never forget one of my favorite interviewing moments was I was like talking to a board member 
Um, and he asked me, he gave me a scenario. I can't even remember the scenario. It was like some very specific, how would you handle this scenario? And I said to him, I'm like, I don't know how I would handle that scenario because I'm not, I'm not in it. I don't have enough information. I can tell you how I would approach it and, you know, who I would work with and, and my thought process that I, the thought process that I would embark on to, to, to come up to, with a solution to that problem. And he goes, uh, if you were me, do you think that, do you think that would be, do you think that's a good answer? And I was just like, oh, it was like a very, like, <laughs> I think I blushed and I was just like, I, uh, and, he, and he was like, I think it's a good answer. I think it's a good answer. And I was like, okay, okay. Um, wow, he think, really wanted to get like meta, like, tell me why you chose to answer that way versus the way that I. Exactly. I'm like, I don't, yeah, exactly. But I do think and it's, it's also funny because at Cloudinary, our CEO and our whole, our whole executive team, we talk a lot about thought process, which is why it's a good spot for me because. I really appreciate the kind of concept of showing your work to get to the, to kind of get to the answer, like how you got to a certain position. And I think it's a superpower and it's a sign of high, like EQ, IQ to kind of be able to explain your thought process and the assumptions you made along the way and share that with people. So, so anyways, that was, um, that's just kind of one of my favorite interview. Stories. Yeah. Terrifying and then ended up being okay. <laughs> that's intense. Well, Allison, yeah. I just want to pry, pry a little bit more. I want to dig a little bit more into that 70, 30 or 30, uh -huh. 30% science, 70% art to 70% science, 30% art. Can you give me like a concrete example of where you've done that? Just in like one slice of the of the seller's journey or buyer's journey. Um. Yeah, well, I think, so what I'm working on right now, as I, as I mentioned, I'll, I'll, I'll double click on the pipeline issue with, with the, at Cloudinary. Yeah. <clears throat> so sure. I think um, we, like I said, so Cloudinary was, in terms of building pipeline, they had models. I don't want to say there were no models, but they were, depending on who you're talking to, either first touch or last touch attribution models, they were very much like, oh, marketing programs is here and channel alliances are here and SDR outbound is here and, and inbound is here. And and they weren't connected and they were also fighting each other, right? Because who do, you know, this person, this this, this MQL or MQA comes into the pipe and, um, you know, they could have, obviously there's, there's problems with that, right? Multi-touch attribution exists for a reason because that's how we're all exposed to multiple different things. And so one of the first things I did was start to work on the with the team on building a more holistic pipeline model, a reverse waterfall, right? Where I'm like, here's the bookings target in Q4. You know, what, what, when do I have to start building that pipeline? When's it going to close going all the way, maybe back a year prior. And then what percent's going to close? What percent's going to lose? What percent's going to push? How much intra-quarter data, how much intra-quarter pipe are we going to create and close? Um, and when you build all of that, what assumptions does that lead to in terms of how many SDRs do we need at what level of productivity and how many salespeople do we need and how many opportunities can one salesperson actually work on at a time? Like we're, we're like 80% done building that, but it hadn't been built before. And I think the, one of the really exciting questions I will be able to answer when I build this and when it's operating, operating as designed right now, like when we're thinking about hiring salespeople or SDRs, we have to have a conversation about that every time we have to come up with a new business case and a new justification for it every single time. And my goal is to say, no, 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 I've got this model here, right? So you can plug in a bookings number that you want in Q1 of FY25. It's going to go beep, boop, 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 beep, boop, boop. Yep. And it's just like, bam, you need this many SDRs. And by the way, you better hire them here because they need to ramp, you know, things like that. And I think this was, I don't want to, because it was still data-driven to an extent, but it wasn't science. It wasn't like this cool kind of soup to nuts scientific process yeah. that is what, I'm, is what I'm really focused on building right now. And I'm really excited to extend that to account management. Yep. Uh, and customer success. And I'm really excited to extend that to um, our channel and alliances team as well, because every, every time it, I, my goal is I shouldn't have to fight for headcount because it should already be understood what the inputs are and the outputs. And, correct, and that, that's where I'm shooting for. It's top, it's top down modeling to inform bottom up planning, right? Like in, in, in a way, yeah. instead yeah. of saying like, oh, we want, I'm just using round numbers. We want 10 million um, AR. We want this to be a, you know, 80, 20 split between direct and indirect channels. Um, go do it right because that's top down that's just bad like this but now you're actually using this to plan and forecast and budget and uh it's not a surprise when you go to the cfo and you say hey we'll, we need another headcount right and by the way my other big kind of thing that i coach my team on is let's have these conversations when we're not asking for headcount right let's have this conversation when you're not feeling desperate and you're terrified and you're scratching at the walls like let's have this conversation with finance with fpna with recruiting with everyone so everyone understands this model like i want to get to a place where there's conditions for ignition right there's like this has now happened we pre-agreed and sure, conditions may change and we have to have a conversation, but at least the model is understood and I'm not, I'm not justifying it on the fly. Yeah. Yeah. I like that a lot. I definitely see what you mean by 70% science now, because you are truly building this into um, like literally like an Excel spreadsheet, I, I'd imagine. Yeah. Yeah. It, multi, I mean, it is a very large multi uh, sheet Excel spreadsheet. Yeah. But that, well, some of the other best advice I got was you know, if you want to like sell to the C-suite or whatever, it's learning to, exec, C-suite executives do not speak PowerPoint, they speak Excel, right? And, and it's totally true. Like, I don't want, 
when when people have tried to show me the plan with the PowerPoint, I'm like, I, it doesn't. It's beautiful, but like I don't. It's not how I'm thinking about things. Yeah. And CFOs certainly don't speak PowerPoint; they speak Excel. And so the CFO is a really critical partner when you're the CRO because you, you guys got to be on the same page in terms of expectations and what's possible and what's not. And it's that this kind of science model that I'm referring to has also really helped me speak better CFO uh, in the organizations I've been in. I wonder if you could you could probably productize that model at some point in the future. I honestly am kind of surprised no one has it. I wonder if they have. Um, I haven't seen it. I mean, I've seen parts of it and pieces of it. I've seen sales capacity models and this and that, but not the whole thing that I'm talking about, right? And certainly not for like account management and channel and alliances. Like oh. I was just talking to my channel alliances guy this morning. And I, you know, we have, um, we're super global. We have channel and alliances um, by regions. We have North America, we have UK and Israel, we have DOC, we have whatever. And he keeps saying, I'm understaffed, I need more. And I'm like, totally get it. But we got to like, what's the model, right? How many accounts are in our ICP that are in the region of the channel person? And how many, oper- like the same, the same thinking should be applied to this. Um, yeah. Show same- me, just show me the gap, show me the Delta, because there's going to be a cell that says negative one and a half, right? Yeah. Or, but let's show, let's model that together. Um, so I, gosh, we could talk for another, I, I have so many more questions and I am just thinking you might be uh, the most operationally genius CRO that that I've talked to in a very long time. I don't I don't want to offend anyone and say ever because <laughs> this is just really, really I'll take it. I'll take it. Yeah, I'll take it. I'll take it, I'll take it with cool glasses. Um yeah. okay, controversial topic. This is a hot take here. Should I don't even want to ask it out loud. Should should marketing should marketing be a part of the CRO org? I know it's a controversial topic. It's like it's like the, the hot topic like 10 years ago was where should SDRs go, marketing or sales. And now now it's kind of like should it be one organization? I, so look, um, I think it depends on the organization. Um, I think I got some really good, and, and I will say at Cloudinary, it is in my organization. So um, I have a, an amazing woman who leads all of marketing, except product marketing does sit in, in product, but she has everything else. And, you know, after my go-to-market VP, go-to-market operations person, she's, she's probably the one I'm talking to the most, right? Because it's really strategic, the work that she's doing. And I think I got some really good advice from my friend, Rebecca Stowe, and I'll, I'll name drop her, who's the... Uh, she's the CMO of Cisco Meraki, and she's she got had other had other big jobs at Cisco. Um, and I called her about this, and she said, you know, brand, um, brand marketing, et cetera. When you're at the stage that I'm at, which is 100, 100, you know, we're going on the journey of like 100 in so revenue to 250 or so. Yeah. Brand is at the, the at, at the service of acquisition, right? We're not doing billboards just to like have brand recognition or perception or whatever. Everything we're doing is at the service of acquisition. And so every dollar we're spending is is at the service of acquisition. And so for us right now, it makes sense. It makes sense that marketing is in in the revenue organization. It makes sense that marketing and every single person in marketing is super aligned and attuned to the, the, the revenue targets that we have and understanding what they are doing and where it's impacting those revenue targets because not much else matters right now. Um, I think as you get larger and bigger and brand becomes um, far more part of the practice and PR and you know corporate communications and things like that. It's you, you can start to make the case that that there could be parts of it. But I I might even argue at some point you start to bifurcate marketing, right? When I don't want to offend all my marketing besties, of which I have many. But it's like maybe there is a, a role in, in a in a broader organization where like demand gen still stays with the revenue organization, but other parts of marketing go go with a CMO or, or something like that, right? Um, I can see it, works- it right now. It's you have your left brain CMO and your right brain CMO, right? Yeah, I mean, that's what everybody think about it, but like it works for us to have product marketing sitting in products. You know, like that's really effective for us at Cloudinary because we're a super product driven company. So I guess the, the annoying answer is it really depends on the company, um, but it, it works really well for us here. What sounds like the attribute that you kind of used as the, maybe the litmus test for is it should, should marketing or should it not be reporting into the revenue organization is the size. If you are a public company like Coca-Cola, and maybe also it's B2B versus B2C, right? Like like B2B less brand heavy, just on a dollar basis spent on awareness campaigns versus salesforce.com. Maybe that's a bad example, but um, I can assure you that planters, I'm just looking at PS planters and whoever the parent company is, spends a lot more on brand awareness activities than, than yeah. that. The most empowering thing that happened to us, I think Cloudinary, we were like struggling with, because we had like demand gen and brand separate or corporate marketing, which is really brand and demand gen separate. And we were really struggling with like the definition of brand or what was, what that, what was important there. And I had this, I called Rebecca and I'm like, how do you think about this? How should I measure brand awareness for this? She goes, you shouldn't. <laughs> She's like, at the stage you're at, you should be really, it's, it's all about acquisition. And so if you can't tie the activities to acquisition and revenue, she's like, you're, it's it's not a good use of your, your investment right now in the state. So size and stage, like, are you in growth mode? You know, um, things like that. So it does depend, um, but it does work for us. Really interesting. Um, last question, Allison, success is often a team sport and something we like to do at cold ones. And it's been really popular is 
who are some of the support roles? Who are some of the SDRs, the other AEs, the sales engineers or consultants, ABM managers, demand gen folks like that you worked with in your career that you feel like have had an outsized impact in your success? Oh, well, that's a great question. Um, Rebecca Soto, I mentioned, so we worked together at LiveRamp. She 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 founded Demand Generation uh, at LiveRamp back in the day. Um, oh my gosh, I'm going to like, this is like an Oscar speech or something. Okay, it comes to mind like, there's two people, two, 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 two RevOps like geniuses, like Michael Heilman, who's now opening up his own shop. He was RevOps at Demand Base, former seller. He's a genius, I think, an operational genius. And like, he made me so much better. Jess Schumann, who I work with at Quotient, also an absolute genius who really helped revolutionize things. Um, and she just had a baby and she's thinking about what she's going to do next. Jay Tool is at Demand Base and he ran um, the SDR team. He's like probably the, like he's just a superstar SDR leader. He gets it more than anyone I've ever seen. Um, and he's, he's, he's doing a lot of new things now. He's, he's so amazing. And I, I don't want to name anyone at Cloudinary because I'll get, I, I don't want to forget anybody, but um, yeah. those are some people from my past, I guess, yeah. that, I can, that I can shout out. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. I, I, I get the same response. It's just like, just pick two or three. That's it. Uh, there's yeah. just some great people, and, and I think they really appreciate to know they made such a great impact on, on your career. Um, well, Allison, you've made it through. No brain freezes. A lot of fun. Uh, I really enjoyed this conversation. I learned a lot. So thank you. Thank you personally. And I know our audience is going to be really excited about this. What uh, What would you like to share with the audience? What's going on in your neck of the woods next year? What are you excited about? Um, you know, 2024, um, we are growing. We are absolutely growing. The company is growing. We're in really good shape, but I think we're gearing up for kind of shifting back into, I'd call it hyper growth or supercharged growth. So we, like I said, I'm very much planning right now um, for, for FY25. And I just hired an amazing uh, VP of Market Operations and Enablement, Christina. Um, I'm like, I can't say the name yet, but I'm like this close to closing on a VP of Customer Growth that I'm super excited about. And once that person is in the seat, I will have assembled the dream team. I will have I will have the team ready to rock, and I'm so excited about that because I want to enter F, I want to enter Q2, um, finalizing these models I'm talking about, and really getting deep into FY25 planning. And I think we're going to have a great year in FY24. I feel very confident about our year. Uh, never been as excited as I am about a company like probably since like I haven't felt this good since like 2017 when I was running TV at Live Ramp, and it was just like the best. I'm feeling great, yeah. um, and like my focus is like. We're going to have a great year. I'm excited about the growth. We're going to put points on the board for FY24, but I am gearing up for a monster year at FY25. And I'm really excited about that. Well, that's exciting. I love it. I can see the passion. I can feel it through the, even through the Zoom. So <laughs> thank you for your time. Thank you for joining Cold Ones. We're lucky to have you. Farewell. Thank you. For having me. Thank you.